Hello, everybody. I'm Danny Roddy of DannyRoddy.com, and I just published a new article on my web blog entitled The Baldness Field, Part 2, In Search of a Unifying Theory of Pattern Hair Loss. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my patrons for making this article possible. You can find a full list of those who have donated to make all the content I do possible on DannyRoddy.com by clicking on the article link. And you can become a patron by going to Patreon.com slash DannyRoddy. Without further ado, let's get into this week's article. Recently, I've been writing about a possible explanation for the horseshoe shape of pattern baldness, as well as a more specific pathology for the loss of hair. I tackled these subjects a little bit in the baldness field, but ironically didn't go over them at all in the book Hair Like a Fox. I think this was because one, I didn't know, and two, I didn't have the same access to research that I do now. Access to research is actually one of the biggest steps forward I've ever encountered, and being able to peruse the history of baldness while others cannot is a certifiable tragedy. Here's a summary of the baldness field. Hair follicles have high energy demands, requiring both glucose and oxygen to grow. However, hair follicles engage in aerobic glycolysis, the Warburg effect, a very inefficient way of producing energy. Metabolic stress limits the availability of oxygen and glucose to peripheral tissues like the scalp, hands, feet, hair, and shifts the fuel source away from glucose to fatty acids. Compared to glucose, fatty acids are poor energetic substitutes for hair follicles. A deficiency of oxygen or hypoxia increases the concentration of mast cells within a tissue. The classical horseshoe shape, or baldness field, is characterized by an increased concentration of mast cells. I wanted to expand on the above to include how the presence of polyunsaturated fats changes the role of mast cells from physiological to pathological, and more importantly, how a model of metabolic stress-induced pattern baldness ties together some anomalous information in androgen-centric pattern hair loss research. I'll close the article with some strategies to restore energy metabolism within the hair follicle. What are mast cells? Mast cells are non-circulating cells in connective tissue, skin, nervous tissue, the linings of the stomach and intestine, and other tissues in contact with the outside world. They differ from other types of cells by containing large granules in their cytoplasm. Mast cells are known to degranulate under both physical, cold, heat, ultraviolet and x-ray radiation, and chemical, various bacterial or animal toxins, conditions. When degranulation occurs, histamine, serotonin, prostaglandin D2, and other substances contained in the granules are released. After degranulation, the granules are regenerated. As for their physiological function, they've been referred to as switchboards of inflammation during the stress response. They're activated by various stress substances, including estrogen, and in a vicious cycle, mast cells can also generate stress substances themselves. In an email correspondence, Raymond Peet referred to them as potential agents of tissue renewal or regeneration. He says, Following from my understanding of the implantation process of an embryo in the uterus and the function of mast cells there, leading to the formation of the placenta, I'm inclined to think of them as potential agents of tissue renewal or regeneration. I think their activation by estrogen and quieting by progesterone suggests that they are probably activators and guides for stem cell formation and differentiation, depending on the availability of support. Their presence in cancers has always seemed to me to indicate both allergies and cancer are mainly systemic energy problems. I think Ray's thoughts on mast cells as potential agents of renewal and their activation by estrogen reflects his extensive work on estrogen's involvement in tissue repair and reproduction. Constance R. Martin noted that estrogens are among the best known of the growth stimulants, and estrogen achieves a proliferative growth state by inhibiting oxidative metabolism, preparing cells to take up water, divide, and grow. Similarly, we know that hair growth is an energy-intensive proliferative process, with hair follicles converting proportionally more glucose to lactic acid than carbon dioxide. Mast cells have been proposed as regulators of hair growth, and their accumulation and activation is in flux during the hair growth cycle. However, as an organism ages and interacts with its environment, accumulating various stressors, this well-controlled regulatory process of mast cell activation and growth might spiral out of control. Part 2. Metabolic Stress and Mast Cells in 1992, young men with pattern baldness were found to experience adrenal hyperactivity, leading researchers to propose that metabolic stress initiated pattern baldness. Metabolic stress substances such as cortisol, 
prolactin, and aldosterone have long been associated with pattern baldness. However, their involvement and meaning in the loss of scalp hair remains relatively unexplored. A feature of metabolic stress is exchanging glucose for fatty acids as a main source of fuel. Oxidizing fatty acids rather than glucose produces less carbon dioxide and restrains the availability of oxygen to tissues. An increase in free fatty acids and a decrease in the generation of carbon dioxide might help explain why balding areas of the scalp were found to be less well oxygenated when compared to controls. Another feature of metabolic stress and carbon dioxide deficiency, or hypocapnia, is the accumulation of mast cells. An accumulation of mast cells reminiscent of the classical horseshoe shape of pattern baldness was discovered in the scalps of balding men in 2012. While researchers didn't hypothesize what the finding might mean, I think the accumulation of mast cells in the scalp and their chronic activation is analogous to a large injury. For example, simply plucking a hair causes surrounding mast cells to degranulate temporarily suppressing energy metabolism, inciting mast cell degranulation, and stimulating cell division, an example of how injury can lead to renewal. However, in the balding scalp, something is different. Instead of injury and mast cell activation leading to the renewal of the hair follicles, it leads to inflammation, edema, fibrosis, and eventually the complete loss of function. The activation of mast cells as physiological agents of renewal or pathological horsemen of the hair apocalypse appears to be influenced and defined by the individual possessing mast cells and the environment that the individual lives in. Part 3 From Physiological to Pathological In 1992, Jarowski et al. found that mast cell degranulation was a normal event in the antigen growth cycle. However, the process was exaggerated in baldness, involving chronic activation of T-cells, the overproduction of collagen by fibroblasts, and eventually fibrosis in the hair follicle. In 2000, the role of microinflammation was confirmed in a significant degree of those with pattern baldness. The authors felt that the crime scene of pattern hair loss led back to the metabolism of the so-called essential fat, arachidonic acid, into the hormone-like messengers called prostaglandins. In 2012, it was discovered that a specific prostaglandin, prostaglandin D2, which is produced mainly by mast cells, accumulates in the scalps of balding men and inhibits hair growth. The accumulation of prostaglandin D2 in the scalps of balding men was proposed as a hormonally regulated process, and the authors noted estrogen's ability to activate prostaglandin D2 synthase. Estrogen also activates phospholipase A2 and cyclooxygenase 2, appearing to contribute to the production of prostaglandins on many levels. Moreover, estrogen activates mast cells, causing them to degranulate, releasing their inflammatory mediators into the surrounding tissue. Like the classical metabolic stress hormones, estrogen is increased during stressful situations. For instance, just immobilizing an animal increases its production of estrogen. However, animals made essential fatty acid deficient produce less estrogen, prostaglandins, and are incredibly resistant to stress. Increased stress resistance attributed to essential fatty acid deficiency, in quotes, might be due to the animal's enhanced respiratory intensity and the production of mead acid, which was found to exert an anti-inflammatory effect. Considering the rate-limiting precursor for prostaglandin D2 is arachidonic acid, and that arachidonic acid is mainly produced from another so-called essential fatty acid, linoleic acid in the liver, and that essential fatty acids are estrogenic, promoting mast cell activation, and at the same time can inhibit the production of progesterone, which quiets mast cells, it appears that the accumulation of the essential fatty acids in the tissues over time play an essential role in the genesis of pattern baldness. Part 4, Synthesis. Many changes occur in the organism during aging. The accumulation of the essential polyunsaturated fats in the tissues, the replacement of copper for iron in the mitochondria, the increased absorption of bacterial endotoxin, various nutrient deficiencies, and an enhanced reliance on fatty acids as fuel instead of glucose. Together, these things tend to shift steroid synthesis away from the anti-estrogenic, protective, youth-associated substances, progesterone, pregnenolone, and DHEA, towards the stress substances, estrogen, cortisol, prolactin, growth hormone, parathyroid hormone, and aldosterone. In the case of pattern baldness, the shift probably leads to the accumulation of mast cells in the scalp, their chronic activation, and increased exposure to the inflammatory mast cell end products like prostaglandin D2, explaining many of the features that are usually blamed on androgens in pattern baldness. 
While many people believe their hair loss or health problems began a few years ago, they probably began early in development. This is why I think it's important not only to engage in self-metrics such as monitoring the resting pulse and temperature to assess the rate of metabolism, but if possible, investing in some basic labs such as thyroid stimulating hormone, prolactin, total cholesterol, carbon dioxide, serum calcium, serum phosphate, vitamin D, and parathyroid hormone to get a better picture of the metabolic situation. In addition to a satisfying, easy to digest diet low in the essential fats that helps maintain a higher pulse rate and temperature, thyroid to increase carbon dioxide and quiet mast cells, vitamin A to increase the synthesis of the youth associated substances and decrease estrogen, pregnenolone to lower cortisol, progesterone to lower estrogen in women, aspirin and vitamin K to lower the prostaglandins, vitamin D to lower parathyroid hormone, which activates mast cells, and a daily carrot or activated charcoal or an anti-serotonin drug to decrease intestinal inflammation and lower bacterial endotoxin seem like reasonable therapies to investigate. That is the entire article, The Baldness Field Part 2 in Search of a Unifying Theory of Pattern Hair Loss. You can check out all the references on dannyrowdy.com by clicking on the article. One more time, I'd like to thank my amazing patrons and just tell them that my work wouldn't be possible without them. And the switch in general to Patreon has just been mind-blowing. Not having to sell people things is a great thing and uh, allow me to retain scientific objectivity, which is important to me to continue my work in a non-biased fashion. Thanks again for listening. Leave all constructive criticism and comments in the comment section. And thanks again. I'll talk to you guys soon.